No, I'm in Peekskill, New York. And, uh, you know, we, usually we, um, we spend a little while chatting this morning and Meg asked me if I had anything to chat about. And I just want to say that I'm not in a super chatty mood. My heart is fairly heavy. Uh, this morning, a dear friend of mine, Danielle Glad, uh, passed away last Saturday um, in the early morning, hours after a year-long uh, battle with pancreatic cancer at 47 years old. And um, Danielle is beloved, not only to me, but many people around Unitarian Universalism, Meg, and uh, part of our SUSE, the Southeast UU Summer Institute community, our tribe, and um, Many people who've known her for years, she uh, was uh, uh, on the vanguard of young adult ministry in Unitarian Universalism when she was in seminary at Meadville Lombard and um, derailed from, from um, pursuing Unitarian Universalist ministry in part because of the white supremacy in our system. I think it's important to name that. Um, she, Danielle was a fierce truth teller, so she would want me to remember her <laughs> that, that way. So, uh, so my heart is a little heavy this morning, and uh, I'm glad to be here, though. How are you, Meg? I, well, I'm also really sad about Danielle. It's just way too young, 47. She was a force. I met her up. She worked at the UUA back in, I don't know, the early 90s, right? That's when I got to know her, and before seminary. And she was just a vivacious, loving presence. I was moved to tears her final words on Facebook where I love you all we don't know if she dictated those to somebody or had given them advance to to say that when she knew that she was about to die but she you know pancreatic cancer is just ugly and I guess we all knew where the train was going but I was at least in some denial about how fast it would get there she leaves a beloved son Yeah, it's it's hard. It's a small movement. We love each other. And I was here staying with Jake Morrill. He's the one who invited me to San Miguel. And I, I didn't know that he'd grown up with her. She, she was part of the Knoxville, Tennessee crowd of LRY that he was. So why are you here? That Jake and Danielle went to, to, to prom together in high school. So they have known each other for many years. Um, so she had many, many connections within Unitarian Universalism, and I know that a lot of us are grieving. And I'm excited to hear that you'll be doing some kind of commemoration at SUSE, where she was beloved, as well as uh, the Southeast UU Summer Institute, as well as um, many other places that, that she'll be remembered. But yeah, most of all in our hearts. So yeah, sobering, Michael, but we'll, we'll keep trying to tell him the truth and upending patriarchy and white supremacy in her honor. <laughs> Jessica, are you ready to talk tech now? I am ready. So as, as you all can tell, this is our first time doing the view on Facebook Live. And um, we're, we are super excited about it. And at the same time, our excitement is mixed with nerves as, as we try to figure out how to do this. And um, so I am on the Facebook Live comment thread um, to, this, to this post. So if you have questions, you post them there and I will pass them along. If you have comments, I'll pass them along to our internal chat. And I'm also on Twitter. And, um, and I'm going to hang out here and, and participate in this conversation at the same time as much as I can. But if I look confused or have a blank stare, it likely has nothing to do with the conversation. <laughs> so, um, but this is super exciting. And I'm, I'm, and I'm really glad to have you here, John and Samantha. Thanks for being here while we're um, testing out this new technology. So um, I think this will also be broadcast on YouTube later, not live streamed, but later. And the podcast should be the yes. same as always. Yes, yes. The podcast will be in the same place as always. And then I will post this video, uh, which I am recording to um, YouTube. So if that's where you prefer to watch it, you can go and check it out there later. So we are excited, as you might be able to tell from backgrounds, uh, Samantha and John, our guests today, who I will introduce in just a moment, are also in San Miguel de Allende. And it's an unusual thing to actually meet our guests in person. Usually I'm more like Michael sitting across, across the country, across the world from the people that we have on. So 
that's really fun besides the fact that it's beautiful here. Um, it's really fun to have them. But before I move to them, I did just want to show you where I am because it's so amazing. So I'm just going to turn my computer. So I'm in a courtyard. This is um, John and his wife Carolyn's courtyard and it's gorgeous. And I'm going to show you the sky too, which is really beautiful and amazing here. And um, just make everybody jealous because I spent the whole winter in Minnesota. So I need to, you know, make you jealous now if I can. So, so our, <laughs> our guest today, so uh oh, now I'm getting feedback. Why? Okay. All right. Our guests today, we have two on the same screen and they, that's fitting because they're a team and they work together. Samantha Silva and John, oh God, wait a second. Sim Simsarian. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's start over with that sentence. <laughs> Samantha Silva and John Simsarian are the part of the strong leadership here um, of Camino Juntos, We Walk Together. And they'll be sharing about their work with that. John is also the president of the UU Fellowship of San Miguel. San Miguel. John is also the president of the Fellowship of San Miguel Allende. Samantha Silva has been brought on board as the program coordinator for Camino Juntos. She's been living in San Miguel Allende for seven years, though she's from Acapulco. She has a marketing degree and she's been volunteering with nonprofits in San Miguel for the last couple of years. So she'll bring in more of the perspective of, you know, the programmatic stuff. But we're really excited to talk about uh, Caminos Juntos because we've had a number of shows about immigration from the U.S. side. And many of us are witnessing the massive deportations in our own communities that are going on. Um, and we've talked about that and we'll continue to talk about that. But it's kind of interesting to be down on the other side of the border and to see that, though, the story might end in Minnesota with how I see these deportees, that their stories continue. And so today we're going to kind of see what some Unitarian Universalists are doing on the other side of the border. John, as I mentioned, is also the president of the UU Fellowship here. So, John, Maybe you could start by just creating a little UU context before we move on to the program. Tell me about the fellowship here. How big is it? How long has it been going on? What do you all do? Sure. Welcome. Sure, thank you very much. And thank you very much for having uh, Samantha and me on the program. Uh, and we're honored, uh, Meg, to have you visiting here in San Miguel de Allende. This is a city that we love, uh, which is a city right smack in the middle of Mexico in the state of Guanajuato, uh, which is a relatively small state, but an important agricultural state uh, here in, uh, in Mexico. Um, I've been president of the uh, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Miguel de Allende for the past year. And I guess I had the honor of being reelected for another two year term uh, just this last March. Um, this is a fellowship that has been in existence for 30 years. We celebrated our 30th year anniversary last year. And um, in the last two years, uh, the fellowship has been growing uh, substantially. Uh, we've uh, increased our membership from somewhere around 85 to 130 people, uh, which is significant. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> this winter, which is our big month when we have a lot of tourists here, uh, we had actually our largest number of people coming to a Sunday service of uh, 240 people coming. Uh, we are a lay-led fellowship, uh, although we pay ministers to come and uh, present one or two uh, services. Uh, we have half of our services led by uh, outside uh, visiting ministers, which is very exciting uh, because we get the opportunity to meet a lot of very interesting people. Uh, so uh, we're happy to have people uh, let us know if they're interested in coming to beautiful San Miguel uh, to join us for services. Um, we're also uh, in the process of uh, trying to uh, I'll put a plug in, if that's all right, Meg. Uh, we're also in the process of trying to recruit somebody who's retired and would like to come and live in Mexico and uh, help us with the fellowship, a uh, UU minister. So uh, that's something on our uh, website that could be found. Um, so that's sort of a quick background about the fellowship. We spent uh, we are. Um, 
all the money that we raise, and we do pledging, um, all the money that we raise uh, is used uh, for two, well, for two things, basically. To support the fellowship, we have no building, uh, so we don't have a lot of overhead costs. Uh, over half of what we raise, uh, we pass out in grants on an annual basis. We have a formal grant process. And uh, this year we're funding eight different nonprofit organizations here in San Miguel, which are geared to uh, supporting uh, Mexicans who find themselves in poverty uh, and need support. So we do uh, scholarships, uh, we do community organizing in some of the outlying villages uh, because we, there are a lot of uh, major um, uh, poverty issues, uh, depletion of the water of the the water table, and so forth. So, John, I know that the congregation congregation is overwhelmingly expats, correct? So, what you are your services are in English, as I understand it. I, I'll go this Sunday. I haven't been yet, but uh, I know you and I had the pleasure of meeting with a local activist here this week who said she loves to go, she's bilingual, and that she's talking to a lot of the local people who would also love to go. And um, so I think it's interesting, the kind of expat culture and the Mexican culture and, and how they um, interact and how it seems like you're, you're reaching out. She was so, this woman, Sarah, who's, who's local, was so excited about the fellowship and said that a lot of the people, the Mexican people who don't like Catholicism, she thinks would love it there. So. So I'll put in a plug for CLF Spanish language ministry and say that uh, I think a global ministry is increasingly as important, though we may have politicians who think walls and barriers are a good idea. That's never what faith says to us. So thanks for all your work as, as your congregation. Let's, let's start talking about um, Camino Juntas. So how did this start? John, I understand that this was, um, this, you were kind of the founder of this. Well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't phrase it that way. Uh, it really was a group of people. Um, we, um, uh, are, we were finding and are continuing to find people that are arriving here in San Miguel and in the state of Guanajuato who ha are homeless. Um, you mentioned Minnesota. So uh, I w uh, we live on a very small alley. We've been here for eight years, uh, uh, my wife and I. Uh, this is our home here in San Miguel. Um, and uh, walked out the front door and uh, we had a conversation with a Mexican neighbor and then we started up the street and a man was sitting on the step right across from our doorway and he said in perfect English, uh, excuse me, I have a question for you. And I said, yes. And he said, um, do you have any work for me? And I, I said, uh, no, what's going on? And he said that he had just arrived in San Miguel uh, he had lived in Minnesota for uh, 22 years, that he was a welder uh, building bridges, that he had a son who was 21 years old in the Marines, uh, and that he was uh, just deported to San Miguel, and he had just arrived. I said, can I get you something? Can I get you food? And he said, yes, but I need water. And so I got him food and water. Uh, his shoes were in tatters. Uh, he asked me, he was sunburned. He had a little backpack. Uh, he looked exhausted. I asked him if, uh, uh, well, he asked me, could I give him an exchange for the three $1 bills that he had rolled up? And so I gave him a good exchange rate, obviously. Um, he, uh, so that is an example of uh, what happens to people some people when they're deported from Minnesota. And of course you multiply that. Uh, there were 150 people deported from the United States to Mexico, 150,000 people uh, deported from the United States to Mexico uh, in 2017 approximately. Uh, to over 12,000 came to the state of Guanajuato, which is where we are. So you can see the problem is significant. So Samantha, you've come on as the program coordinator. What are your hopes for this program? Well, uh, hi, first of all. <laughs> um, I think this is something that both communities are 
right now facing. Not just the US with the deportation, but the Mexicans like giving the people that's facing deportation the support that they need. So what I, what I expect from Caminamos Juntos is working together both communities to help these people uh, settle, start, start to try a life when, where they can, which is now Mexico and Caminamos Juntos, San Miguel de Allende. So many of the people, because I know, because up in Minnesota, I'm, att I'm attending ICE hearings and watching the other side of this horror. Um, many of them left Mexico when they were very young. Are there, are there cultural considerations, Samantha, as you see, you know, people who are ethnically and, you know, genetically Mexico, but, but their whole lives they've lived in the United States pretty much. Do you see cultural challenges there? Oh yeah, I think the cultural the cultural aspect is the the most important challenge that they're gonna face because this is a community that they don't know. They're not related to this. So I I see as uh, caminamos juntos as as a way to help them uh, blend in, in this community because I mean this is not right now. This is not their home. So we want to help them start feeling like home. What are some of the cultural differences that, that you observe that, are, that make it challenging for people to resettle? Or is that too big of a question? I think here in San Miguel, I actually can tell that the first thing is language. A lot of them, just don't, they don't speak Spanish. So that's one thing that... Uh, it's really important, but then the the I think the employment uh, culture, the salaries, everything here is so different for them. So, but I mean, San Miguel is one place that both communities are united. So it's a first. I mean, I it's a good way to start in San Miguel. Yeah, because not only is the UU congregation a whole lot of expats, but San Miguel in general has a very high percentage of expats. I know coming up from Mexico City, where we heard virtually no English for two weeks, I, in any given cafe, half the people are likely to be Canadian or from the U.S. Yeah. John, how does, how does the organization try to, to meet those needs? Well, uh, first, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that... Um, uh, the the uh, uh, the expats here in San Miguel, as well as uh, Mexican people, were hearing the incredible uh, language that was coming out of the United States uh, during the election process and after the election process, uh, with all of the um, uh, racist uh, attitudes and language and. Um, uh, xenophobia uh, that was coming in. Uh, many, many people were very upset by that because here we are living in Mexico uh, in this wonderful, wonderful culture uh, here where people are just so kind and uh, so wonderful uh, to, to be with, uh, with such a rich uh, historical tradition and so forth. And uh, and, and to be hearing that uh, sort of rhetoric uh, was very upsetting uh, to, uh, to so many people. And uh, so we uh, uh, got together as a community, uh, or at least advertised as a community, that we wanted to get together and talk about uh, what's going on and what can we do. Uh, and, and it's difficult because here we are in Mexico and, uh, you know, you, you can't go to your congressman and, and go to Washington, D.C., and you can't go to uh, protests and whatever. But what can we do here in Mexico? And so we brainstormed that. We probably had uh, 50 people uh, that showed up from multiple organizations, uh, from other religious uh, congregations here in San Miguel and, uh, and other groups and individuals. And we brainstormed and said, well, we need to welcome back people who are uh, experiencing uh, the deportation process. 
Um, and so it, it came out of that group that uh, we should do this. And so we've been planning it for a long time, uh, trying to figure out how to put this together uh, for over a year. Uh, but what came through for us was the chalice lighter call, the UU chalice lighter call. Let me tell you, that got this off the ground. Uh, so we worked- It was the South District, right? The, the Southern- uh, the Southern region. Southern of, region, of which then Miguel de Allende is part of the Southern region of Unitarian Universalism. Yeah, we're the and only- Christina was here region. today, that's her region, so. Oh, good. I think we're the only uh, UU congregation in Mexico that's uh, part of that for whatever historical reason. But they helped us. And through that, we raised, uh, we've raised at this point, we're still raising money through that, although it's, tr it's ended, uh, over $27,000. Plus the, uh, our congregation is putting in $5,000. So that gave us a base of $32,000 that has launched this project and allowed us to hire Samantha. And we're just so pleased uh, and we have resources to pay for emergency shelter and things like that, that Samantha can describe some of the uh, programs that we're planning to put in place. But it was the Chalice Lighter call that got this program started. And it's a broad community program. It's not a program sponsored by our fellowship, but we're one part of a larger project. So Jessica will be putting onto Facebook links where you can uh, give money to support this project. And I hope that people will do that as well as supporting the other, other end of it. And um, just, just saying what you said, it's so obvious, but the, the lies being told by this administration about everything, including one of those classic reversals describing the Mexican people invading the United States, when in fact, history shows the exact opposite of the United States uh, invading Mexico over and over again. And I'll say, I came here in part as tonic for that and have really been helped. And I encourage other Americans to come down here right now because boy, did I not know how amazing it is. So yeah, um, you've been, um, You've been experiencing something for a while that's, I mean, I've been to the beaches of Mexico before, but I've never really learned the history and, and the culture as much. And, and it is really healing. Um, so let's, um, Samantha, can you describe some of the programs that John was referring to? Yeah, of course. We're uh, right now on phase one of uh, Caminamos Juntos, working with a structure. So we have around five committees and five task forces with professional people working on aspects like legal, medical, um, basic needs, which is housing, food and clothing, employment. And right now we're, we're, we're gathering all the information that we need. We're approaching government programs, we're approaching uh, social programs and to star assistant the national Mexican nationals and support them in the life after deportation. Would you describe a little bit, Samantha, about what sorts of issues are in the legal task force? Well, the legal task force is, I think, one of the most important. Sometimes people come back and they don't have the documents needed to start an, a job, to get into the uh, social security. So one thing that it's going to be a priority is getting these people all the documents they need. Uh, sometimes it's just as basic as the birth certificate. So from that, it's, it's at least like a, a, about 10 documents that they need so they can start working on it. We're going to provide all, all this help and we're going to help them, help them get all the paperwork in place so they can start uh, finding jobs, they can start applying for programs and all they need. I understand. Actually, Michael, go ahead. I mean, I just, it sounds very similar to uh, things that, that we have to deal with with homeless folks here. Uh, and I, you know, I work with a woman who's, who's homeless in this community and she has no identification. She has no birth certificate. She has no social security mm -hmm. card. So when she when she goes to apply for a job, she has no proof exactly. that she's eligible 
uh, to apply for the job. So I imagine I, I know how hard that is here. I don't. I imagine it's similarly difficult uh, wherever you go. Well, Michael, what we're hearing from anecdotally is that frequently people are stripped of their documentation by the ICE workers before they're uh, deported. Now, whether that's <clears throat> accurate or not, I don't know, but that's what we're hearing anecdotally uh, from people. And so that's a need right off the get. Yeah, we tend to believe those people. Uh, Amnesty International did a whole uh, study of ICE and it was called a, a culture of cruelty. And it does seem like ICE deliberately makes it absolutely as difficult as possible for people to um, to make it. And so there's an element of trauma for the people who come here as well as their families back home. Uh, but um, there's there's that element of trauma that you must also be dealing with. Is that part of what you're looking at as well? Yeah, we're, we have a task force named Medical and uh, Mental Health Task Force. And we're gonna work with therapists. We're gonna go, we're gonna, because after, imagine after uh, facing that, how, how, how support do you need? And we're actually working on a support group for those people to get, to get together, to talk about this, to relate with people that has, has been facing this too. We have a, Me we have a Mexican uh, woman who's had experience yeah. with uh, running support groups who has volunteered uh, to do that mm -hmm. no mentoring issue. Yeah. And the importance of uh, trying to have mentoring. Uh, Samantha is also working with uh, the establishment of a Mexican yeah. advisory group. Do you yeah, we're working uh, with a Mexican advisory group because I think it's really important to have both, both aspects, you know, and, and, and starting with, with, with the emotional support for those people to, to start understanding the culture because it's a new culture for them. And then start, start making them feel at home with the community and I think this Mexican advisory group is gonna be one of the most important things Caminamos Juntos is gonna do. Like working with people, Mexican volunteering are, for me now, right now it's amazing how many people are interested in working with the Mexican nationals that have been deported. All, we have a lot of people right now uh, that, ha that have a professional uh, education saying, I wanna help, how can I do it? We have over um, uh, over a hundred people who are currently involved in one way or another with the yeah. organization. So we're, it's uh, quite a task to get that all figured out, but there's so many different uh, issues that need to be addressed that it's fantastic to have these active uh, uh, groups uh, addressing those issues. So you described this, um this what seems to me to be a very very large challenge that everyone who finds themselves there will face the cultural challenges the the legal challenges the psychological the medical um is the plan also then to work on uh employment and housing i mean or are you are you is there is there a vision for for what comes after um, those first step, you know, once people have paperwork and are, are in, in a support group? Right. Uh, so there's the short term emergency nature of things, mm -hmm. which we, we right. which is which is huge. It seems. It yeah. And, and we're partnering with a shelter uh, uh, in uh, Salaya, which is about 30 miles from here, that uh, called Abba House and Abba House. Uh, uh, supports people who are going north from uh, Central America and uh, mostly Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And they also uh, support people who are coming south having been deported. And these are people who by and large primarily are riding on freight trains. Uh, and so uh, Abba House will uh, help us with some of the immediate crisis piece for uh, the first uh, few days, if someone needs a safe place to sleep, uh, uh, food, um, 
uh, shower, clothing. Um, and then we will work collaboratively with them uh, to then bring the person to San Miguel and develop a plan that they would like to have. Uh, and so we will do that crisis piece collaboratively with uh, Ava House in most cases. Um, one of our task forces has found uh, short-term housing here in San Miguel where people can go. Um, and then we need to be looking for longer term stable housing uh, as people find jobs. Um, and we have a job and education task force that's working uh, around identifying job possibilities. So uh, there's the short term immediate and then the longer term ongoing uh, issues, Michael. Does that uh, because people need to have stable housing before they can uh, yeah. deal with other life issues and uh, they need to have an income, obviously, as well. The other thing that the Chalice Lighter Call has helped uh, was with, we at least had the seed money to get started and we're now looking for other foundation money, uh, other grant money, uh, because that's just a seed money situation. And the Chalice Lighter gave us exposure in that area too. So we're actively pursuing other grant possibilities for longer term funding. This, this isn't going to necessarily be a short-term uh, project, but we're hearing stories of, uh, you know, people committing suicide and so forth because of uh, the uh, problems of being able to assimilate, uh, being able to find jobs, uh, having lost their families, uh, all of those things. Um, we, we want to work with, um, for instance, the... Um, uh, uh, sanctuary programs, and uh, we've just sent out a communication to, is it called UU Rise, um, asking that our program be advertised uh, to the sanctuary programs so that if somebody does not have a family to come to in Mexico, that this would be an option for them. So uh, that's something that uh, we could use help with actually is uh, disseminating that uh, this is an option for people. Although we encourage people to go to their families, uh, Mexico has a very strong culture of uh, families supporting one another. We're not suggesting that people should just come to San Miguel. That won't work. Uh, but uh, the, the idea that if someone is really isolated, um, we're working with uh, somebody now, uh, uh, actually there's someone who's been in detention in uh, prison for the last six months. Um, and uh, his wife is a U.S. Uh, non-Mexican citizen. And uh, uh, what's going to happen to this man when he gets deported? Uh, should the uh, all the appeals uh, run out? And uh, so we're trying to communicate with her about this is an option, and and for him to know that this is a potential option because he doesn't have a family, as I understand it, here in Mexico. So that's another so, example. Yeah. Samantha, I'm curious what your friends, you know, just kind of the people, you know, in Acapulco or other places. I mean, though we can we can talk about the horrible language that our current president has been espousing. In fact, many people call President Obama the deporter in chief. This isn't a new this isn't a new phenomenon. All of the people getting deported, although certainly they're ramping up and targeting activists and doing some other things in the United States. But I'm curious kind of what you know, what the people who have been here all along, um, if there is a feeling of welcome back or if there's a feeling of you deserted us or, you know, and that's a huge question and every single person probably has 10 different feelings about it. But how would you say in general the, the folks who have, you know, who are Mexican are responding to this crisis that's being created um, in the United States? Well, I think one thing that Mexicans have we have is a strong family structure. So I think uh, I don't see I don't see Mexicans being being uh, rejected to to the Mexicans coming back. But I can see how many cultural aspects are can be difficult, even 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 for for people that live in in Mexico like the not understanding some 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 of the cultural uh, aspect that they're bringing but 
I mean, I think right now we're, we're also facing uh, something with the government. So I think me Mexico is more united than, than, than before. So I just see support right now. There's a lot of aspects like aspects that can, can be, can be in, in an aware, awareness for everybody, but I just see support right now. I think I think Mexico is becoming a really really united united country with, with the with the social aspect that's facing the world. You want to talk about your? Do you want to talk about your contact to the uh, person in Guanajuato, uh, the Guanajuato State? Yeah, right now we we are approaching Guanajuato is is one of the biggest states that has this uh, immigration problem. So uh, there's a government institution called Instituto para el Migrante Guanajuatense. So this is only helping people from Guanajuato that have gone to the U.S. and their families here. And we are going to work with them in a program to help people in Guanajuato get the government help and get all the support they need. How many of the people that, that you see there uh, are originally from Guanajuato and how many are from originally from elsewhere in Mexico but wind up there because it's you know, where, the, where the train uh, left them off or because it's a, a more welcoming community? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're just getting started, Michael, so we don't have large numbers to tell you about, but uh, we have some examples. Uh, so, uh, someone, uh, um, again, someone who was married to a uh, U.S. non-Mexican uh, wife um, was uh, deported. Uh, he went to his home community and found that uh, he, uh, actually, he did this before he was married. Uh, he was deported, went to his home community and found out that he was not welcome there because his Spanish wasn't such. He didn't know his family there. Um, so he uh, decided to go back to the United States. So he again entered the United States illegally. And um, then he married his uh, US wife, has two small children, uh, two years old and uh, five, I believe. And uh, he was picked up again and uh, this time deported again. Uh, dropped in detention facilities for a period of time, uh, separated from his family, dropped off on the other side of the border with nothing. Uh, his wife and children decided, his wife decided that she wanted to join him. So they left their house and their car and his job and so forth. And they selected San Miguel de Allende to come to specifically because she did not have a uh, significant command. Of, she didn't know Spanish, basically, mm -hmm. and his Spanish was not very good. Uh, so they chose San Miguel to come to, and uh, they arrived here in June of last year. Of, yeah, last year. And uh, she is a very active advocate and spokesperson uh, and is an active player on our um, uh, steering committee for Caminamos Juntos, and she's actually going to talk, Meg, you'll get to meet her on Sunday, uh, Katarina, uh, and uh, she has some of her own uh, YouTube uh, material and so forth, trying to educate people about that, and she'll be uh, helping, uh, she wants to help families reunite uh, here in Mexico, should they wish to do that, and uh, she's a fantastic uh, spokesperson. So that's an example, uh, again, of uh, the welcoming part. You know, it, uh, it really varies uh, depending on how much connection people have and who they are and who their families are. But generally, the Mexican families are very strong. One of the problems when you're talking about uh, some of the pushback uh, might be around, will there be enough jobs? Mm -hmm. Because we have, while San Miguel looks quite wealthy, we have an incredible ring of poverty all around San Miguel. Uh, so uh, we would like to be able to create jobs. Uh, so uh, someone has proposed um, establishing a call center here because we have people who speak good English <laughs> who will be coming. 
So uh, someone has uh, started to think about that as an example. So maybe we could create jobs in San Miguel. Uh, so if any of the listeners uh, have an interest or ideas about that, that would be something we would like to hear about. And uh, some of those activities like a business plan for a call center could be done uh, in Minnesota, Meg. Uh, you don't, I, want, you don't want me doing your business plan, John. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, maybe you would do a business plan, Michael. <laughs> but anyway, you got the idea. <laughs> also not my strength, but maybe one of our view viewers, uh, it is theirs. Great. So, um, gosh, a question came through in the middle of that. Oh, shoot. So the interfaith piece of this, you're working with the the Salinas Center, which, as I understand, is led by an evangelical minister. Is there a, is there an interfaith community around there? That's, I mean, for most of us doing this work in the U.S., it's not a Unitarian Universalist thing. We're in broad coalitions with groups of immigration groups and you know all, all kinds of folks. Is there a, is there that kind of a coalition in San Miguel or in the surrounding county? Um. You mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the program in Salaya and, and why you mentioned that he was a minister. I, I, want, to be, I want to point out that he's not, uh, uh, you see no evidence of that when you're uh, in the ABBA facility. Uh, uh, yes, he says he sees God in everyone who passes through his door, but uh, he's not uh, promoting uh, uh, religion uh, in the facility. Uh, he's just one of these fantastic people it's he, his wife, and his two adult children, a volunteer to run the shelter, which uh, has a capacity of 80 people. Uh, two weeks ago when I was there, they had had 150 people in the shelter. Anyway, so we're collaborating with him, and he's collaborating with the Red, uh, International Red Cross and so forth. Here in San Miguel, the original planning group that I talked about, uh, we had other uh, uh, religious um, uh, groups uh, with us in addition to uh, other, uh, like the Rotary Club and other organizations. So um, we, uh, the, uh, the, he was actually a bishop of the, uh, in the uh, Episcopal Church, has been an active member of the, uh, our steering committee. Uh, we're outreaching to and have had in the past people from one of the other churches uh, here and also from the uh, synagogue. Uh, well, we have a uh, Jewish center here. Um, are, the Catholics, point, are the Catholics jumping in in any way? I mean, the Pope has been outspoken about immigration, but it, in the US, it ranges from diocese to diocese. Mario Lopez is uh, a member of the steering committee and is chairing the Mexican advisory group. And uh, he's made some outreach to the Catholic Church to this point. Uh, we have not been successful at uh, bringing the Catholic Church into the group, but we've tried and we'll continue to yeah. do that. And we'll continue to try to work with the other uh, religious groups to try to bring them in. But we do have, um, as I say, uh, representatives from other organizations here. Um, so let's see. We're missing our two, our two, uh, Christina and Aisha. I should, I should have said that's okay. both um, of them dealing with um, health issues and we want them both to be very healthy. So we're glad that they are taking care of their bodies today, but I, I'm missing them right now. Right, right now, a brilliant question. I can't think of I'm wondering if you might tell us some of the other stories of, of the people that, that you've met um, doing this. Because, you know, for me, you know, so much of this is, is about humanizing this, yeah. uh, this in, inhumane system yeah. the United States has. Right. In the, in um, the I, I uh, met a, uh, a Mexican uh, man uh, in a uh, city that's uh, relatively close to here. It's uh, Pascuaro, when my wife and I were there with our, our grandchildren uh, visiting. And uh, he's very concerned also in Pascuaro about this issue. And um, he wants to know. He's a, uh, he wants to know uh, how we're developing, and uh, would like to use us as a possible model, Caminamos Juntos, as a possible model uh, to do some replication in uh, Pascuaro. 
And he was telling me about a uh, young man. Uh, he was in his uh, uh, mid twenties uh, who uh, he befriended who had been um, uh, deported. And he said there was a group of 30 different uh, people that he knows in Pazcuaro, uh, not a community that will be serving. We're focusing on San Miguel. Um, and uh, how sad it was because uh, this particular man was very, uh, very uh, likable, very nice person with great English skills, but he had been involved in um, uh, gangs in the United States before he had been deported and had gang tattoos uh, very visible on his uh, face and neck and head. Uh, and uh, he said while he was, you know, he was extremely capable, he thought, and was uh, able to, uh, uh, would have been a very effective employee uh, in this man's uh, uh, organization. He said he just couldn't hire him uh, because they interfaced with the public and so forth. And that's what this man faced uh, continually as he was uh, trying to find jobs. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, that has... Uh, sort of re-emphasized the idea of uh, trying to set up a, uh, a, like a call center, for instance, uh, uh, Michael, you know, where, uh, you know, people can do their work, but don't necessarily have to be seen. Uh, and so there, I think there are probably others who would fit into that uh, example as well. And he ultimately committed suicide uh, just recently. Uh, because of his frustration of not fitting into uh, society and not being able to find a job and really identifying himself more as a U.S. Uh, uh, resident, citizen, uh, even though he wasn't a citizen, but a U.S. resident um, as opposed to somebody in Mexico and how, what a struggle it is. So that's why I think these support groups are very important and why uh, job opportunities are going to be so important. So, you know, I don't want to bore you with organizational structure, but uh, maybe Samantha could just quickly, uh, just to give you an idea of how well we're, or how we're organized, we think relatively well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just some of the other uh, groups that we have that are working on issues. Well, the, the, the first one is participant support, which is uh, the, first, the first committee that's going to have contact with with the people and has all the all the things that we talk about michael like the shelter and the housing and the immediate basic needs the documents then we have a communication committee um what right now we're we're gonna launch the website we're gonna have a facebook um page and the volunteer committee which is one of the most important uh, committees because we are working with amazing people that are volunteering their efforts and their the skills and then the resource and mobilization committee who is working on the grants and and uh, all the things that we need for funding and the fiscal committee because we're gonna have we're, we're having uh, an ac in mexico and the u.s so yeah, yesterday um, I uh, went with Mario Lopez, uh, who's on the board, uh, to uh, sign for our uh, organizational uh, status here in Mexico. So in three more weeks, hopefully we'll have that. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we're also uh, probably today submitting paperwork to establish a 501c3 in the United States. We had originally hoped not to do that, that we would be able to partner with another organization, but the administrative costs associated with other organizations uh, it makes it more uh, cost effective for us actually to set up our own. So we're putting those structures in place as well. Um, so that will help us obviously with the grant, uh, other grant funding uh, opportunities in order to be able to continue this project after the uh, chalice lighter seed money has uh, been used. So uh, again, you know, ideas that people may have about uh, possible ongoing funding sources would be very helpful to us. Uh, uh, as well as the Chalice Lighter program continues to function. So 
uh, as a possible, uh, you know, as a, a, a place to fund us. Uh, and that can be found on our website, um, UUFSMA, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Miguel de Allende. I don't know why I'm frozen. Oh, there, I'm unfrozen. <sighs> Freeze tag. Welcome to have you back. <laughs> Thank you. What are some things that people on the other side of the border, you, you've been mentioning some, but if you, uh, you know, are there, are there committees that meet like this that where people could actually join in or are you more looking for individuals to kind of contribute stuff? How are you, how are you anticipating and maybe you're not yet because it sounds like you're very, very busy getting, getting going, but um, looping in the people who would like to help and, and connect up from the other side of the border. Well, uh, right now, I think the the most important thing is the the, the volunteers uh, here in San Miguel that we can we can provide the the immediate uh, support. But that's a that's a super good suggestion, Meg. I think working with organizations and with people that have that can volunteer. From the U.S., it's it's something that we should we should be reaching out. So, what uh, Samantha is saying, you know, like this idea of uh, uh, helping with a business plan for uh, establishing a uh, a company or uh, you know maybe a cooperative, I guess would probably be the from my vantage point might be a good thing, uh, so that we could create jobs here in San Miguel uh, for people. And our uh, incorporation document uh, leaves it open so that uh, we're not just having, the corporation doesn't have to only support uh, people who have been deported, yeah. but uh, if we created an organization that could both uh, hire people uh, who have been deported, but also uh, Mexican citizens here who uh, would uh, benefit from that as well. Um, and, you know, there are different groups of people who are being deported in that 150,000 that uh, were deported. Uh, we've been talking and focusing today a lot on people who have uh, gone to the United States when they were young or have lived in the United States for 20, 30. Uh, we have an example of someone who is 65 years old and lived in the United States for 50 years uh, with family in New York and was deported. Uh, so. Uh, but we also have people who have gone for shorter periods of time, uh, uh, but yet are uh, uprooted from their lives in the United States. Maybe five years they lived in the United States. Maybe they went as an adult, but they returned to San Miguel and they're facing some of the same issues that Samantha talked about. You know, uh, there's still a cultural issue in, in reestablishing here. Loss of... Uh, their family in the United States, the emotional issues associated with that. And so we're learning or we're hearing from different uh, people who go out to some of the poor villages around San Miguel that this is a problem because people are returning and don't have jobs. Uh, so we need to uh, be thinking about that group of people as well. You know, again, people who maybe went later in life but still established a lifestyle uh, and uh, may even have a family in the United States that they've lost. So I think support groups yeah. are for different populations of yeah. people. One of, the, one of the targeted groups uh, I'm noticing in Minnesota and other places is activist leaders who are actually organizing uh, the immigrant communities are really being targeted and, and removed. And I've I've kind of fantasized, this isn't uh, something that you have, you have plenty of a long list, but I've kind of fantasized about some kind of a leadership school with those brilliant organizing minds, joining the organizing minds that are already here, thinking about, uh, you know, how to create this kind of stuff, because um, they are, they are very deliberately removing some of the you know, the, the organizers from Mexico and all other parts of the world. And, um, and it seems to me that that's actually a very valuable resource, <laughs> you know, th those minds. And um, it would be a dream for some, but some, you know, someone who's listening who has connections to Ford or something, but to bring those people together somewhere uh, to envision, because Samantha, I think you were alluding earlier that 
the positive to this is that it does unite those of us who, who so vehemently disagree with this kind of uh, selfish, self-centered policy. As we close, because we're in our last few minutes, Samantha, what would be your, your greatest hope for the work that you're doing? And, and John, I'll ask you the same question next, but what's, what's your um, real hope that you can accomplish? Well, right now, right now, Meg, I think uh, accomplishing all the objectives that Caminamos Juntos have. Uh, I want to mention too, really quickly, that we are having a local event awareness to raise awareness. And, and this, this thing that we're doing here gives me uh, an, an idea of what you're mentioning, working with other organizations around the world talking about this and just bringing an, an, an event online discussing this um, this issue will be will be will be amazing and I think for me for me personally bringing both communities together it's the most important thing because these people need both supports so I don't know John well we're certainly fortunate to have Samantha. <laughs> Uh, helping us with this project. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, what we talked about, it's a, this is a humanitarian effort to support people who are uh, in need of that support. And we've talked about the specifics of uh, what people need. And so that's what Caminamos Juntos was established to do, uh, to provide that humanitarian support. Um, and to welcome people uh, who happen to arrive in San Miguel uh, back and to make sure that we treat everyone with respect and dignity, uh, particularly since they've come out of situations where that has not happened uh, and to let them know that uh, we're here to uh, be of help. And again, uh, if uh, people have ideas about how we can get in touch with and uh, let uh, the sanctuary programs uh, know about the fact that we're here, uh, we would appreciate that support and obviously uh, any ongoing funding support. Uh, but thank you so much for uh, yeah. your thank humanitarian work. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Next week, we have Jen Jennifer Nordstrom and Manish Mishra Marzetti talking about their new book, Justice on Earth, People of Faith Working at the Intersections of Race, Class, and the Environment. I hope that this new platform works well for you. We'll be tweaking it. Jessica, thanks for doing the tech. Michael, thanks for joining us. John and Samantha, thank you so much for this work, and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.